Welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. Today you will meet the five-star general of the army of students and housewives. And this is what Nate Natan Sharansky called this woman that we have as, as our guest. Her name is Pamela Cohen, and she is the author of this book, Hidden Heroes that we're going to make a focus of our conversation. But the reason I invited Pamela is because the movement of which she was, if not uh, the leading person, one of the leading people there, played a very important role, a crucial role, in one of the most important events of the 20th century. That is destruction of the Soviet totalitarian states. Dissidents and the Soviet Jewish immigration movement. This is what undermined the legitimacy of that country. And our guest, Pamela Kohn, played a huge role in it almost from the beginning. Pamela, Welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. Alexander, thank you so very, very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you. Pamela, the first time we met was something like 35 years ago. Your co-chair... Um, Marilyn Tallman. Marilyn Tallman invited me when I started doing my commentaries in NPR's Morning Edition. She invited me and one at one on one of your meetings, and uh, that was a very interesting meeting. And then after the meeting, we came to your office, and uh, so she was sitting, and you were walking in, and this is the first time that we bumped into each other. You know, uh, uh, Marilyn told me, you know, that you were the chair, you know, and uh, uh, you looked like a chair. You looked like a good-looking woman, you know, that should be a chair, you know, and. <laughs> Uh, so that is the first time. And then uh, 35 years passed, and now we're meeting again. Uh, in any case, so you wrote a book. You published a book, Hidden Heroes. Pamela, what, what is the book about? Uh, look, I, I, I wrote the book. Uh, as a participant and a partner and as a, as an eyewitness to uh, the what I call the hidden heroes, the, the especially the Jews and the dissidents in the Soviet Union who selflessly um, took enormous risks to assert their right, their fundamental right to, to leave the country. Um, many of them for the right to live as Jews, many of them for the right to speak out on behalf of themselves and in their and and their and their goals. Um, so in a sense, I'm I'm the messenger um, for uh for those people, the hundreds and thousands really whose voices could not have been heard in the United States without people like myself to to be able to bring their cause to to the and champion their cause. Um, so the story really is not about me. The story is about us about about a, a, a movement of people of led by you know people of incredible moral stature and moral courage. Um, in the Soviet Union. And my motive, my goals, in a sense, were, were the same as they were, you know, 30, 40 years ago before it was to bring their voices to um, to the, the halls of the Congress and the White House and, and the press um, to to uh, magnify and to to show what is happening inside the Soviet Union. And today it's to be able to bring to the public, the American Jewish and non-Jewish public, um, the, I, the, the values of personal courage, of moral courage, 
of what it stands to what it means to stand up and be counted, um, because I don't think that those values are really respected and and certainly not modeled today. So mm -hmm. that's the purpose of the book. Uh, in my mind, it is very good reason to write a book like this. But we live in the age of rising anti-Semitism worldwide. Correct. And a book like this, I know that for many, for majority of anti-Semites in Russia and in the United States, because there's a lot of supporters of Putin in the United States, Correct. will serve as uh, uh, another reason to call people uh, like us um, uh, destroyers of what Putin called uh, um, a cause of greatest catastrophe of 20th century, collapse of the Soviet Union. What do you say to that? Look, I mean, I have a, uh, a, a, a very, well, I would say, refusenik mentality. It's very Stalinist propaganda. <laughs> what I, what you, what that, that, I, that idea. Um, I'm not aware of that. There are so many uh, uh, supporters of Putin in the United States. I, incredible, I, I, no, incredible number, incredible number, just absolutely incredible. I mean, we're talking about Tucker Carlson. Most of his uh, listeners, most of his supporters, are for Putin against Ukraine. And that's just the beginning. On the left, there's a lot of them too, around nation, Versa Publishing, and on and on and on. Democracy Now. I mean, they're not as active, but look at this. Those 30 Congress people, you know, that produced uh, a letter demanding, you know, that uh, Biden would call for negotiations, you know. They're part of the same group. Although they consider themselves left, they're the same as on the right. But what I'm saying is this that uh, 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 in Russia itself, you know. Um, yes, in Russia. <laughs> yes, I mean, I can understand. I understand that for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, this, this is what the, what this, the Soviet mentality, you know, to reimpose a, a, a the, reimpose the, a large Russian, uh, quote unquote, utopia empire. This is this is what he's what he wants to do. And personally, I think that America has been uh, is very naive, and I think the administration was extraordinarily naive. I mean, I think people like you and I knew what Putin was going to do from day one, and the United States certainly didn't signal any kind of a strength. And and Putin knows how to deal with that. He's very. Look, from the very beginning, we knew that I, I certainly know, and I'm sure you know, he is dangerously clever, dangerously smart. He can he 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 knows where he's going. He has I mean, he has a, a long range plan um, and what he I mean, to me, this is a natural unfolding of what his aspirations were from the very beginning. He's very dangerous, and I don't think the West was really up to standing against him. And so they gave him a bavakasha, oh, please go right ahead, take what you want. They they signaled it with Crimea. They signaled it with, with weakness. And I mean, I think that that's part of the story of, 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 of what, what, you know, what this book is is telling us because from the very beginning when we did have the greens in in the 70s we did have the peace movement as you know that was very pro pro soviet um we had a lot of the left wingers i'll tell you i remember absolutely clearly and i don't know maybe if you remember this when uh, it must have been like maybe something like 19 i would say yes like maybe 19 between 1982 and 1984, when the chief procurator Rakunkov was brought to from Moscow, was brought to Chicago to meet with the American Bar Chicago Bar Association, 
And I can't tell you how many lawyers, Jewish lawyers, went to welcome him, who was, he was the very, you know, procurator that was arresting Jews and dissidents and sending them to Siberia. So we've had this mentality, you know, throughout history. And, and, and the, what, what Putin is doing, in a sense, is very, very much in line with his, his uh, precursors. And he's following a script. And the United States is not, is not doesn't doesn't read history, doesn't understand history, and is not prepared to stand up for to him. So, in that sense, I totally agree with you. Hmm. Yeah, at that time, it was mostly people on the left who were pro-Soviet. People on the right were not pro-Soviet. Now, right. people on the right are pro-Putin. They identify many of them identify with him a lot, and people on the left identify because they're against America. So uh, at least many of them. So yes. that's why they identify with Putin. But getting back to a history of uh, a struggle for Soviet Jews, I have another question. You know, it, it happened to be uh, you started, uh, uh, you joined or you uh, became interested. What year? So in the it, Like I learned about the movement with, with the Leningrad trials. Mm. When there was a, a news uh, pro, I think it was John Chancellor actually in those in those days on on, on thing NBC or CBS that announced that that there was a uh, attempted hijacking from of Jews from the Soviet Union to uh, who was supposed to be to Sweden and uh, I, I understood right away airplane Jews, uh, hijacking of airplane attempted yes. Air, okay yes uh, they were going to take a plane from uh, Leningrad to Sweden. And that immediately struck me that Jews are not hijackers. There's more to the story. But in those years, in 1970, go find a repeat, a, you know, explanation of the story. And there was no internet. And and it took a long time to be able to find information about who those hijackers were, what their motives were. And step by step, I began to become involved. There was something... For me, when I heard that Jews were being arrested in the Soviet Union, I was born during the Holocaust. And I, you know, was 16, 17 years old and started reading about the 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 Horban Europe and what had happened. And right away I reacted, my reaction was, how did a my parents' generation allow one million children to go up the smokestacks? And when I heard that there was going to be Jews, my people, arrested in, in Russia, something inside me screamed, not on my watch. And, and that was at the time when you were still secular Jew, right? I was I was secular. I was a young mom. I was identified Jew. Mm -hmm. Look, I came from like a home like most people came from, even in Russia. We knew we were Jewish. Um, we had, of course, many more opportunities than uh, than people in the Soviet Union. But I was my parents were very identified. Um, we were not, you know, we were like like everybody else. We were Yom Kippur Jews and Passover Jews, and but very identified. Um, and very, um, uh, very devoted both to our people and to Israel, feeling responsible, you know, each one responsible for each other. And as I said, I, I, I wasn't religious, uh, but I was, I felt a, a responsibility that these were my brothers, my sisters. This was the, we're from the family. The only thing that separates them from us was that my grandparents decided to leave and they didn't. Um, what was the reaction of other Jews around you when you raised this issue with them at that time in the beginning? That's such a good question. You know, it's such a good question because today, retrospectively, when you talk about Soviet Jewry, people are saying, oh, I was at this demonstration and it was Soviet Jews. Can I tell you there was absolute apathy and, and self-interest. People were it's 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 not much different than today actually people were living their own lives we were all raising i had three little kids we were raising our kids um people were 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 involved in in husbands working late no one really was no one really resonated to it it took a long time for us to start building a movement at 
in, when I after I heard about the the Leningrad trials and understood that people were being arrested, I did was able to to get information from a from a very few sources, and uh, I started writing protest letters to the Soviet embassy, and then I gathered young moms together, and we with our babies and our coffee on our laps, we were you know, writing letters and calling our congressman. And then I realized that someone told me that that in around 1977 or 76, it took that time for that to realize that there was an organization called Chicago Action for Soviet Jewry run by a woman who was from at that time from Oak Park. And she had an office at Spurtis College of Judaica downtown. And I contacted her and she was brilliant. Laurel Pollock of Barbanel gave me what I considered a um, a PhD in Soviet studies and in international relations, American U.S. policy relations, and the non relations between Israel and the Soviet Union, which was extremely complicated. And I learned from her. And um, by 1978, I traveled to Russia. She briefed me. We went to five. My husband and I went to five cities. We met with the leadership of the movement. And um, when I came back, she retired. And I I was totally unequipped to become chairman of Chicago Action. I, I was I, I had no fulfilling, you know, no great philanthropic ties. My husband was starting out in business. Um, with little kids. I was terrified of public speaking. I wasn't what I would call a leader. I didn't have a P. I mean, didn't, I, I was a, at my education was as an English teacher. But when she, when Laurel said she was retiring, I, I couldn't I, I not I couldn't I had no uh, no other choice but to continue um, as the chairman. And I brought the organization, moved it to Highland Park where I could get volunteer moms to come in and help me staff an office. Um, Marilyn Tallman at the time was a speaker for the U, U, the UJA, the, the federations. She was a Jewish history teacher and she had a big following and had all kinds of philanthropic ties. So Marilyn became my co-chairman. And um, we, I set up an office. I, my family was always in business, and I sent up a very business-like office. It was, it was all run by volunteers, which I was also, but it was going to be a completely professional office. And the idea was that the, I, the platforms of the organization were going to come from the Soviet Jews themselves. They were going to, in a sense, be our our not only our role models but they were going to dictate the policies of the organization we weren't do-gooders we weren't you know like oh you know we were we 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 really believed that we were um implementing the will of the human rights movement inside the soviet union and taking their voices to 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 the west but you were the best do-gooders I mean, uh, I have to say, you know, do-gooder in my mind is nothing, uh, does not sound bad. When you do something for someone else, in my mind, that is a do-gooder. And there's very few people in this world that can do a lot for somebody else without asking something for themselves. You know what? I think the interesting thing is, is that we felt, when I think about it, we felt we were doing it for ourselves. We were one people. We we weren't, it wasn't them and us. Uh -huh. I think the thing of story about this movement is that, and I think you people will see it in the book, it wasn't about them and us. It was about us. We couldn't be whole. We we felt ourselves fractionalized, marginalized, not unified because a piece, a very substantial piece of us has been broken off. A very and, good point, uh, Pamela, a very good point. Uh, it was I, us. I'm corrected, yes. It was us. And yeah. and to tell you the truth, uh, when I look back over my, my experience, I and my family received and got so much from those people that helped that that we were supposed to help they were really 
nurturing us, feeding us, educating us. Um, we learn so much for them from them. I, I became like a different person because of I. I always say I'm a child of refuseniks. You know, they molded us, and it changed us, and it changed us all. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, was your mother uh, no married, I, married to a lot of people? Child of no, refuseniks. No, no, I, I, no, I meant I. The, the whole refuse Nick movement. I understand. Uh, Pamela. Really, really. Pamela, I want to ask you a question. When you look back, I mean, it's been now uh, almost 50 years since you joined, when, when, when you started, when you became very active in it. And now, of course, there's no, nobody's talking about uh, Soviet Jewish immigration. Very few people talk about it. Although, in my mind, this is probably one of the most element of uh, uh, Jewish history, um, the second half of 20th century. And uh, I want to ask you, after looking back at it, you know, the impact, what was so special about this particular um, uh, movement? Because I have to say, uh, when you look at the history of the United States, during the 1930s, the United States was not a refuge for Jews of Europe. And in uh, uh, 1920s, it was not, you know. Uh, so, but it, at the end of 1960s, the United States changed its mind. So my question to you is, first of all, why did the United States change the mind, its mind, uh, with regard to Jews and uh, um, what was the impact of this Jewish Soviet Jewish movement on the Jews in the United States and on the United States as a country? Okay, the first question first. It didn't happen naturally. The, the 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 government's um the government's position on refugees was not was happened because of the grassroots movement which is what i turned our movement just people um i just want to say that just like in chicago action there were volunteers activists who were were working there were ultimately 34, 30 uh, country, uh, councils throughout the country that were doing the same thing, that banded together under an organization called the Union of Councils for Soviet Jews, which I ultimately became the president of and served for 10 years. But this, this, this grassroots movement was very fundamental to changing the position of the, of the American government on Jewish immigration specifically, starting with the Jackson-Vanik Amendment in 1974, which tied trade to and Soviet most favored nation trading credits to Jewish immigration, um, to extending to um, the number of refugee slots that were were um, allocated by the State Department for Jewish immigration, pushing for family unif reunification, which was and and um, uh, the um, classification of Soviet Jews as refugees. So the American government's position on in its attitude towards Soviet Jews was directly a result of the grassroots movement. That is incontrovertible fact. Now, the government's position, um, I mean, it's, it, it, it becomes a little bit more complicated because depending on the administration, it, it, the issue of Soviet Jewry became like a, um, a weapon or a, 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 an arrow in the American arsenal to, to deal with the Soviets. It was another, just that we had, we had economic uh, issues and national security issues. Um, we also had human rights issues and we built that into the um, international uh, 
relations with the Soviet Union, with the Helsinki Accords. So we were putting pressure on the Soviet American government, step by step by step by step, layer by layer by layer, to make them advocates. Um, and especially the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, um, ally that we had was the American Congress, because we could use the Congress in order to affect change in the state and to push the State Department um, and both the White House. So it was done on a very, I would say, uh, mechanical, very logical uh, uh, methodology. Now, and why uh, why was Congress at this particular moment oh, in history was so willing to collaborate with you? Okay, now that is and that that was because we developed a structural mechanism. So, if for example, it with all the congressional districts in the state of let's just take Illinois, but don't forget this is just a patent that will be applied to New York and California and Florida even North Dakota, wherever we had councils, and there were at least 34 of us, of them, what we did was to give the names. I had developed a caseload. I, one of the first things that I did when I became chairman was to start uh, documenting the cases of every refusenik that we knew and to keep an accurate, up-to-date list for not only ourselves, but for the that we would ultimately give the State Department um, for their negotiations with, with the Soviets. So we had an extensive database of, of refuseniks, which we couldn't advocate. I couldn't advocate out of Chicago action uh, the, 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 um, on behalf of, I don't know, 500 refusenik families. What I did was to take uh, systematically the, a case and give one case to an organization or one case to a synagogue. And I strategically, we strategically allied synagogue, we call them adoptions, to congressional districts. So the, um, the, 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 the congressional district in Rockford, Illinois, had a synagogue in its district that had adopted the case of I don't know, say Mary Austin or any any of the refusing cases, and those synagogues would be pushing their congressmen um, on 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 to to push the Soviets to release this case, um, and they were plying them with information about this case, sending postcards with their pictures of refuseniks or and dealing with this, with the congressman from a grassroots. So the congressman really. I mean, he had constituents pushing him on an issue that there was no 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 reason not to say yes. They it was on both sides of the aisle, both Democrats and Republicans had no they they took. I remember when I took the, the case to of Vladimir Kislik to John Porter from the tenth district after he was this big who was, who was a great congressman, right? Yeah, but you want to know something? What? The guy was. At, we walked, Marilyn and I walked into that office in, in Wilmette mm -hmm. and with like, with, you never saw a tall, so Gentile congressman, absolutely polite, elegant. And we started telling him about Soviet Jewry and we gave him the case of, of Kislik and we trained this man from the ground up. We sent him to the Soviet Union. He eventually started the House Human Rights Caucus in the in the in the in the House of Representatives, he was a, a, a incredible incredible speaker on behalf of human rights. He was a great congressman, but that's how we worked. So the Congress became our very strong ally because it there was it was a win win situation from them, and they had we had the backing of their constituents. And then of course what we did was to make sure that their local press also you know covered cases and. It it so they they it they they became a real strong extremely import, important force for for Soviet Jewry and for human rights in the Soviet Union. Very very interesting. Now and my second question was what was the impact of this moment for Soviet Jewry on the American Jews and on the United States as a country. Or no impact at all. No, you know, it's a very, very interesting question. 
and it's really one that deserves almost like a, a, a study because in 19, what was it? 18, 89, when was the, the I, 89 was the big uh, 250,000 uh, su the, the summit in Washington. I think it was in 89. Gorbachev came to meet Reagan in Washington. Gorbachev in, came in, in 1987. In 87. Okay. In December was Hanukkah of 87. Right. And there was a um, major demonstration really called for, for by Sharansky um, on the mall in Washington at Hanukkah when, during when, during the time that Gorbachev was to arrive, 250,000 Jews showed up. And if you think about that today, or if you think about that as Ellie Wiesel, both Ellie Wiesel and I both spoke about it, if that kind of a expression public expression i remember i was there okay so you know that you know how it might have changed the public awareness under roosevelt mm -hmm. at that moment it at that time it was a solidifying empowering um um reaction to the soviet jury movement it brought jews together in america it brought jews a sense of national pride, um, a sense of unity, a sense of purpose, a sense of accomplishment. Um, was that lasting? Look at us today. We're very, the Jewish people in America are extremely fractured. Um, and, and, and every issue in, in under the sun is important to every American Jew, except the Jewish issues. Jewish issues are somehow, you know, way down on the on the on their list of what's important. I saw somewhere uh, results of the survey that Israel, a Jewish state, the only Jewish state, ranks, uh, I think, uh, almost at the bottom in the yes. minds of American Jews as their interest. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So you know the 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 the, the Soviet Jewry movement served a, was in a, a point of enlightenment for American Jews. It was a point of clarity. There was a moment in which American Jews understand stood the difference between good and evil. There is no. There is no that those distinguishing lines have been blurred today. Israel is is considered anathema. It, it is or ir, irrelevant. Um, and now I I I it with the the journalistic, uh, 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 it's just unbelievable how writers can get away with writing news like they're writing. But uh, you know every American Jew would anyone who considers themselves fairly intellectual has to read the New York Times and they're reading left-wing propaganda beyond belief. Um, and now certainly with the elections, it's just incredible. And there's no clarity. There's no clarity. There's no priorities. There's no sense of unity. And there's no, there's no, there's no sense of national purpose or even, I, 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 I we don't even have enough stamina in, uh, um, stand, to perpetuate ourselves, America, American Jews are bleeding out. They're, they're, they're bleeding out. Um, they don't have the courage to stand up to the anti-Semitism on campuses, regardless what people think here and there. Um, and they find excuses to defend anti-Semitism. Oh, the, the after all, look at what's just happening in Brooklyn. That's just the religious people, you know. Don't worry about them. That that's not us. We're 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 different. It's very very. But, but most of Jews uh, did not uh, uh, come to defense of those victims of black pogrom in New York. Exactly, either. exactly. And they won't even admit it was a black pogrom. 
They won't admit it. I had a conversation with someone on the North Shore la the last night. They do not, they real because they are so liberal and their 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 idea of of systemic racism is Well, I would so not call them liberal. I would call them just uh, yes, left, uh, left. Whatever, yeah. Uh, because they're so infected with this 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 far left ideology, they they are it's 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 uncomfortable to, for them to recognize that there's a dichotomy that there's a problem with there 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 can be ra there's racism in America, but you often have to realize that this that 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 there's an infection of of anti-Semitism in parts of the black community. You've just got to recognize it. So are you saying? that uh, that moment in American Jewish history where basically most of Jews were supportive of achieving eventually became supportive, not in the beginning, but eventually became more or less supportive of the goal of achieving, you know, the free immigration for Soviet Jews. That moment is no more? It's hard to find it. I, I I can't see it. I I don't I don't see it. Now, by the way, I want to tell you something that it in I, I don't want to open a Pandora's box, but is we're 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 trying to analyze the situation even at the time of the eight in eighty seven. It there was a broad a broad agreement of Soviet Jewry from different parts of the the Jewish community. But it wasn't completely united either. I mean, there were there was a a section a section of American Jewry in the establishment that believed only Aliyah, Rock Aliyah, only Aliyah. It, it, there was no such thing as refugee American ref, Jewish refugees. They shouldn't do a Jew should not be coming to America, and they pushed on closing the doors to America, which is something my organization, my people, our grassroots fought desperately. We believe that we had to keep the doors open to the United States. Pamela, I'm fully aware of it. In 1988, okay. the United States started shutting down the door for Soviet Jews. Exactly. And I led the demonstration of 1,500 Soviet Jews in Italy, Rome, to American embassy with a protest against American policy. And I have to tell you, Hayes was against it. Yes. Other Jewish organizations were against it. Rome, police of Rome, commissioner <laughs> wanted to arrest me. Two weeks later, George Bush Sr. signed the order to let all those Jews in the United States. And because of Frank Lauten and, and, Le and the Lautenberg Amendment, which uh -huh. Frank Lautenberg was incredible, in which he said he passed a, 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 an act that was ultimately became law that all Soviet Jews, there's a presumption of... of um, of persecution and that they should be allowed in as refugees. And so they're, they, 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 it was an important one. Huge. Despite huge. the fact that the situation changed for the better sig significantly, people could apply in Moscow for the, Correct. to leave uh, and without losing the citizenship. I mean, before that, all Soviet Jews that left Soviet Union were stateless. Correct. Correct. No. So uh, that was an important amendment. Well, I mean, so the point is, is that there, there, there wasn't such complete unity, um, it, it in the movement. There were, there were, there were issues that that and and everyone had different organizations had different motives. And however, today, I I I think that what you said is exactly true. I think that, um, what what. The, the statistics about American Jews and and their um, their recognition of Jewish values, their recognition of their of Israel is is just very low on a list of priorities. And I think that we have the bottom line is is that I think we have a lot to learn for the Soviet Jewish movement. I think that there is a lot to be learned. I think we have to be learning it. I think that there should be studies, continued studies. I hope one of the reasons I wrote the book the way I did with, you know, with with um, footnotes and with 
uh, references to because I want it to be used as a basics for future studies. This is the first book that really deals with the reality of the, the complexities of the movement, even though it's written in a, you know, in an easy to read style. It, it doesn't um, whitewash the differences between the approaches of the state of Israel and the establishment and the grassroots. And I think there's a lot for us to learn from it in terms of both poly government policy in terms of moral courage and, and what freedom is. I mean, I, I have to tell you that I when speaking to uh, second generations, from people that came from the Soviet Union, there's a clarity that they have that Americans don't have. The understanding of freedom is is completely different than American what Americans' free, idea of freedom is. Um, I really think that the future of American Jews lies in the in the in the children and the grandchildren of the people who came from the Soviet Union. Um, I see the leadership. I see their the 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 Zionist organizations. Um, uh, uh, across the country of students are are increasingly run by uh, second generation from uh, from the Soviet Union. Um, people who are learning with some of the um, outreach organizations um, to, to develop their sense of identity, second generations. They're the future. I think they're the future of American Jewry in America. I do. There's future for Jews everywhere i mean uh no matter how many times we have been threatened with uh annihilation and destruction and disappearance correct. you know holy place can never be empty correct that's true that's true we've been assured we will always exist but i do think that when in looking for leadership in america of, of young jews i see it in i see it in 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 the second generation People please. Well, and I think that your book uh, can be a good, good um, guide to acquisition of that uh, sense of common Jewish identity. This is a very important thing. I mean, I, I think Torah and your book today, this is must read for all people. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. What do you mean you cool. hope so? I'm telling you what I think. I okay, think, well, so. but I hope that they'll read it. I mean, I hope that that really will be the case. Because I, I, I do not know if they will read it. You know, people will read who are interested in being a Jew. Right. This is what I'm saying. If That's you're interested in being a Jew, then read this book. If you can read right. English, read this book. Right. But I have to say that uh, this book may be also uh, uh, need to be reworked a little bit in to smaller uh, brochure in Russian. So Russian Jews would understand what it means to be a Jew because they do have the sense that you pointed, you know, of being Jewish, you know, this, this because there's nothing else. But many of them also do not really know what it means to be a Jew and they go in different directions. Okay, so we have a project that we can be working on together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drafting you to help me do that. Well, I, I, I do not guarantee it, but, you know, I think this is the proper thing. I'm going to uh, take a better look at it as a potential project because it is a very important project. I mean, it's not for nothing that you were invited to Krug to give a presentation there, you know, to Russian uh, community, you know, in uh, Wheeling. And it's not because Russian Jews are interested in this, uh, because this is part of, of our history. I, mean, I, I just want to say that I have been asked by several people to see if we could be published in, in Russian. Uh, I, I, I see today, no, well, uh, things are changing under uh, Putin. But on the other hand, they will be changing in a different direction as well. So the book can be published. Um, we can talk about it. You know, I'll ask, you know, uh, Michael Greenberg, you know, publisher of, uh, um, a major publisher of Jewish books in Russia, if he wants to do something like this, because that is an important thing. And, 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 and for starters, probably some of the 
uh, excerpts from this book should be published, you know, as articles because they're in Russian because they're very important uh, ideas and facts in this because this is a good book written by a great person. Thank and you. you know, and, there, and there, I mean, in, in Israel, there's, there are, you know, so many Russian speakers that um, aren't comfortable certainly reading it in English. Of course, not only in Israel, there's still a lot of Jews in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, my fig I saw, saw somewhere that there was about 350,000 Jews in uh, uh, Russia still, and about 100,000 Jews in Ukraine. And those Jews uh, want to read, although they have different issues now and different problems that they need to deal with. But Jews in America, many Jews in America uh, need to read this book because they came here, they are here, uh, and many of them don't even know what they went through, what their parents went through, or what they themselves as children went through. Uh, a lot of information is very confusing in their minds. And this book clarifies the issues, you know, and that's why I think this book is important for uh, especially Russian Jews, you know, for, for the first generation, many of them have difficulty reading in English, but second generation has no problem reading in English and they can read it as a <laughs> book on history of uh, uh, their uh, parents and grandparents. And thanks to you, Pamela, this book exists. You know, I, I see that it got incredible endorsements from almost anybody who is anybody. You know, Sharansky and Preger and uh, Dershowitz and uh, Abrams, Elliot Abrams, you know. You know all kinds of people and those people know you because you were, you played a very important role in creating a unified identity for American Jews. And for America at that time, of course, not anymore, this uh, Soviet Jewish immigration was a huge club that they could wield, ideological club, over the Soviet Union. It was probably their most important uh, um, ideological uh, uh, Mm, weapon. I mean, it was who Reagan, I think, said it. You know, people vote with their feet. He meant, first of all, Soviet Jews moving from there to here, you know, and that was the sign for Reagan and for the United States, you know, that the United States was better country because a lot of people in the United States, you know, being socialist, you know, wanted to go that direction. I mean, like crazy idiots. If you do not have a job here, therefore, Soviet Union is a better place to go and have a job. Wow. No. They have to be real morons, you know. That was, <laughs> this is, I spent many years uh, 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 writing articles for In These Times, leftist newspaper, when there was a publisher, uh, Jimmy Weinstein, uh, trying to advocate for left in the United States to change its attitude, to help democratic movement in the Soviet Union, to not see Soviet Union as their goal or something like this. And uh, I was called all kinds of names. Yeah, I was going to say how and how, yeah, I'm sure you were up against. <laughs> He's a right winger. He's a this, 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 this. Yeah, horrible. That's that's what that's what that same thing is today, right? Well, now it's different, but you know, I have to say, uh, 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 what does not kill us make us stronger, yeah. and we will never give up. No, we won't. <laughs> those people who are against Jews, they don't even know; they cannot even suspect what they're against. Them. I mean, the, yeah, half of the world claims that they are real Jews. That we, you, and I are not really Jews. They're the real Jews, circumcised in heart or instead of uh, body and none and none and none and none and none. That's the beginning of their attitude toward Jewish people. I know. It's, it's, it's horrifying. 
I, I, tell, I, I to tell you the truth, Alex, yeah. I, um, I'm worried about, about, about the future uh, in America. I, I, um, I think that Americans are in general, very soft and very naive and very untested and very self-absorbed, let alone commercial and materialistic. And I, the generations that I see coming up today, and I'm only speaking about Jews. I, I'm also a student of Jewish history. And we're in a different, in a different uh, generation. This is a different generation, and it is a different mentality. I grew up at a time when, and my generation, almost ex a lot of us, were second generation who had grandparents that came from Eastern Europe, with accents and memories and and Yiddish, and even if we weren't observant we do who we were. I can tell you that today, our grandchildren, I'm not speaking about me, I'm talking about uh, this collective. They, kids are American. They're, they're American. Their grandparents aren't from Eastern Europe. Um, many of them are, are um, very assimilated themselves. And the kids are even more so. Um, and I don't think that they, I think that we, because we're so, Americans are so uh, naive, don't think that we are a, enough aware of the anti-Semitism and the Jew hatred around us. And I'm afraid that it can, can be converging from the left and the, far, and the, the left and the right, as you pointed out. Um, and uh, this is this is this, this is the this this is just a situation for the last 50 60 years because if you go a little bit further you know to 20s and 30s american jews were fully aware of the nature of anti-semitism in this correct. country correct and i'm afraid that i'm afraid if i can really express my my real fear is that i'm really afraid that we've entered a period that the younger generations have entered a period that's very, very, very much like Germany between the wars, in which Jews were absolutely German. They were absolutely confident Ger German citizens. They built the railroads, they built the economy, they were lawyers, they were doctors, they were very, very successful. And they were sure that this ragtag group of of right wingers under this painter named Hitler would never amount to anything and it was nothing and it was we have an, we have to be sensitive to the fact that we can't predict what future is going to be and we can't to, um, we can't imagine what is around the corner but the winds of danger i think are blowing in America. I think we have to be strong. I think we have to be, I think that, and this has been my message when I talk to kids on campuses. If you take a look at a refusenik who was from even the provinces, provinces, uh, Vilnius or Riga, where there wasn't a, uh, a, a, a Basco, press bureau, American press bureau. And there wasn't the publicity. And yet, and they weren't standing up against social anti-Semitism, which is right now what we have in America. Right. So, it's, it's still not there. It's just beginning. And it's just beginning. But it's social. It's it's not right. political yet. Right. But it's social and it's running rampant in, in on internet. And yet, the Jews in the Soviet, in the former Soviet Union, stood strong and stood proud. Were proud of who they were, and they, and they, and they, and they, 
were Pamela, Jews that you saw and that yes. you dealt so, with. Excuse me. That's majority of Soviet yeah. Jews did not stand proud right. at all. Correct. But I'm talking about those. That's right. why I'm making the distinction between these hidden heroes. Mm -hmm. They have to be a model for American Jews. Absolutely. Today. Stand proud. Know who you are. Fight for who you are. You are you are a proud Jew with a proud heritage, a proud people. This is the only defense against anti-Semitism. There's nothing else. Nothing. It's within you. And Correct. that's why I highly recommend your book. That's why I said Torah and your book, this is what today's Jew needs. Totally. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. In any case, it's nice that we agree on so many things. <laughs> Pamela, I hope this is not our last conversation. And uh, uh, it was great. It was great to talk to you, to speak to you, and uh, we'll do it again. And I'm going to take a better look at it and see, you know, what we can do from your book and what we can do maybe in Russian there or something like this. Anyway, as they say in China, Pamela, Zaygizent. <laughs> Thank you. And to you too. This is just a pleasure being with you. And I, I also feel like we have to do this again. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you both so much. It was great.